Hello everybody, I'm Bill Harris and uh, we welcome you to Life Questions, a program that addresses questions and answers from about life from a biblical perspective. With life being as complex as it is, we're seldom, if ever, without some questions about it, whether it's uh, making decisions that we, uh, that we have to make, how do we get over the past to get on with our future, or how best to deal with the challenges of the future. We are grateful to have uh, you, our audience, sending us the many questions about life that you've done. And uh, we have invited a panel of local ministers to address your concerns, and I'd like you to meet them right now. And they are Pastor Charlene Williams of One Church, which is in Lima, Ohio here. Also, Pastor John Berger of Transform Church, Transform Church here in Lima, uh, Lima. And then Pastor Russ Thomas, of the Gathering Place and New Creations Lutheran in Elida. Those are two separate congregations <laughs> under one pastorate there. And rounding off our panel is Pastor Robin uh, Zaruba of the Lima Baptist Church, and he is the worship pastor there. Glad to be We're happy to have you all here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Now, you know, one of the questions that we got, very interesting, you know, from time to time we hear of unpleasant things in some ministries sure. across the country. And uh, with the death of um, uh, Christian leader Ravi Zacharias, sometime last year, mid last year, an investigation was done and said to have found that there were issues of sexual abuse and the like taking place. Mm -hmm. And this is being bandied about, people are discussing this thing. I think it's something that we Christians ought to look at head on rather than try to run and hide away from. Um, what do we do when we see that someone of the faith has not been all that faithful and it becomes public knowledge? How do we deal with that? How should we deal with that as pastors? Well, I guess at its core, um, we need to look at not only spiritual leaders, of course they're held to a a higher accountability, of course, but the Bible says so, but uh, we need to look at those spiritual leaders uh, the same way that Jesus looks at us. You know, there's, uh, there's standards in Matthew 18 about how we address a brother who is sinning. And, um, um, the, but the key is repentance, is repentance and, and growth from that. Um, mm -hmm. We're all sinners saved by grace. So, uh, but we need to hold each other accountable. Um, we need to be intentionally holy um, the Bible says so, holy, holy and righteous. So um, I think that uh, when people look at our integrity, um, we're representing the integrity of Christ at the same time for mm -hmm. a non-believer. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that uh, we hold each other accountable and repentance is the key. Any other thoughts on that? I think humility is key for us. It's easy sometimes to look at somebody else and say, boy, I would never do that. Mm -hmm but for the grace of God, so I go. Mm -hmm. So we need to remember that. And I think we should also uh, make place to pray for those that were involved personally in that, um, because it, it can be a salvation issue for some who, who had talked, like we had talked earlier, um, had looked to maybe Ravi more than Jesus for their salvation. Mm -hmm. And now their personal lives are, mm -hmm are in disarray right now because of this. So uh, you know, many people to pray for in all of this. You, you touched on that when we were talking before airtime, that sometimes we can get caught up in the person. Yeah. Could you expand on that a little bit more where he yeah. left off? Yeah, um, if I back up to a little bit, I think one of the concerns that I have is when we um, put our responsibility to live out Christ on our leaders or somebody that we respect, or somebody that we admire. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we give too much of responsibility. And so it becomes difficult when that person fails because it's human. And now that you're not held to a highest um, standard, standard yeah. as leaders, because we are, but when we put so much of, of, of responsibility on someone that when they fail, it cripples us. Right. It, it, I remember it happening to me as a young believer. Ah. Um, and I remember what it did to me. So it kind of caused me to calibrate my walk with God and take my responsibility with God. And so I look to Jesus, mm -hmm. the author and the finisher yeah. of my faith. But on the other hand, it's unfortunate that people get hurt in the church. 
And I think that breaks my heart as a mm -hmm, pastor, mm -hmm. that sometimes we forget our responsibility as leaders, um, mm -hmm. but then as, as parishioners, you forget your responsibility also, mm -hmm. so. I think that, that that's the silver lining that you mentioned there. It's like Jesus is like, hey, you, you, you've been focused on this personality, this person. I'm over here. Yeah. I'm Jesus. Uh, you know, I'm the main thing. Uh, it reminds me of uh, you may some probably all of you remember Jimmy Swagger back oh, yeah. in the day when he had his sure. big fall. Sure. And I remember the big discussion was, you know, what about the people saved under his ministry? You know, were they really saved? You know, and I, even as a young Christian, I was like, Jimmy Swagger didn't save those people. Jesus saved those people. Mm -hmm. So it's a, as you said, a recalibration. If it, that silver lining is what gets us back to, hey, you know, this is nice to have encouragement uh, from these uh, leaders, you know, on the television and nationwide, but Jesus is the main thing, yeah. you know? So I think Jesus can take a situation like this and, and make some great good out of it, you know? Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. People will fail you, but Jesus never will. Right. Yeah. Not sometimes, every time yeah. people are it, gonna it, fail It's you. just a matter of time, isn't it? That, 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 that mm -hmm. people will And I think in the discipleship process for us as pastors, that are um, nurturing younger ones, mm -hmm. I think that should be part of the culture of the church, mm -hmm. to encourage our young people to keep our eyes on the Father, right. not f running after personalities, mm -hmm. but keep our eyes on the Father and have that, that highway to heaven clear at all times so that we can run to Him. So I think that would help. Very good. Spouses are good for that as well. You know? <laughs> Don't think you're all that, because you're not. <laughs> To, help to bring a balance, <laughs> absolutely. You know, turning <clears throat> to another very serious itch issue, that, and that of uh, being gay, uh, there's a, <clears throat> a parent here that writes about a, a son that is gay and uh, saying that this, this, this son has been gay all, all through coming up in age, starting in grade school. He noticed as a very young, at a very young age that that boy tend to have that type of leaning and coming up through college, working. And, and now the parent is saying, I'm really concerned that the church would not accept my son the way he is and has some real serious concerns about that. And what would you say to a parent of a gay child and if that parent is a Christian wanting that child to have an opportunity to come down that altar and accept Christ, now maybe the child wants to, maybe the child doesn't, but the parent certainly wants the child to be a Christian. What would you say in the way of encouragement to a parent like that? This is another good question that we got from our viewing audience. You have to think about it a while, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> to me, the first thing that came to mind when, when I went over that question was John 3.16. Okay, so it's, we don't fix our lives and then come to the Savior and then say, okay, I'm ready. I mean, all, all of that fixing flows out of our belief in a Savior. So that, you know, once we've got that out of the way, then, you know, to me, that, that's not just the main thing, that's, that's the only thing. But you, you know, know, some people are not aware of that. There are people who do believe they've got to kind of fix themselves sure. up together Amen. before they can, they want to be more presentable. And I think that's where a lot of grief uh, and dysfunction and problems come from, is from people thinking that they have to get cleaned up. Now, I think the, the issue, the problem here, I call it a problem, is that people involved in, let's say, this gay lifestyle would say, there's nothing wrong with me, so I don't need to be fixed. That's, that's where mm -hmm. we, we come to sort of blows here. So somebody help me out. <laughs> carry that on. So to, to touch on what you were saying, um, you know, the, the scriptures are very clear that we're to be fishers of men and our job is to catch them and bring them to the foot of the cross. And, and I see that wooden cross, at least it was in my life with the things I was going through at the time, uh, that wooden cross is the fillet board that the fish get laid out up on and cleaned. So that's kind of how I see that is yeah. um, we're to bring them to the foot of the cross. We're to, to, to speak to them the truth of God's word and then the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. We, we conduct 
our, once again on Matthew 18, we conduct ourselves in the same way as a sinner um, in, in how we bring them to, to, the, to the throne of righteousness. But um, it's a fine line between <clears throat> judgment and, and, and what the brother's talking about here. So um, love is the key here. Mm -hmm. But love without truth is a lie. So we, we, do need to, we do need to encompass everything that is in the Word of God when we address folks in any sin, whether mm -hmm. it be the sin. I had a lady confront me not too long ago, and she said, why does the church always pick this topic and attack it? And I said, we don't. As a church, we address every sinful issue that comes through our doors. I said, it's just that this issue has a larger social vo voice is why it's noticeable yeah. so much. Yeah. I Good said, point. if somebody comes to me in my church and, and has committed adultery, um, we're going to address that sin as we would homosexuality, but that adulterer is not going to run out to the media and complain about what the church said to him. That's the difference. They yeah, have a voice yeah. that's very vocal, yeah. and, and so it seems like the church is picking out that mm -hmm. one, but it's not. We're on a daily basis addressing the sin in our lives and the sin in our congregation's lives. I want to go back to that one point you made, in essence, and I've heard this before too, that God has called us to catch the fish, but not to clean the fish. That's his business. Mm -hmm. So if, if, we can, if we can persuade through love homosexuals to come to church to hear the gospel, then if they accept Christ, they must know that Christ is going to change them. Anybody that's got a hang up, he's, he's going to change us because we all come to him with hang ups. He was hanged for our hang ups. So how, how, do we, how, do we, how do we do this persuasively to get them to understand that the Lord wants to change us all? It's not just because you're homosexual. We are all sinners when we come to Christ and he wants to change us. Scripture teaches that we are a new creation when we come to Christ, mm -hmm. but there is a process, it's a lifelong process of the natural, out, or the, I should say the supernatural outworking of that that is done through the, the grace of God, through the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Titus chapter 2 teaches us that grace teaches us to deny worldly lusts and ungodliness, uh, and then Romans 6 tells us that that sin, our sinful nature, our, 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 the, the natural proclivities that we were born with don't have to have dominion over us because we're not under law anymore, we're under grace. Mm -hmm. So God's grace is sufficient, but we have to surrender and submit ourselves to Him daily in all manner of living. Mm -hmm. And one of the church's responsibilities, I think, too, um, you know, when you look at the secular world, when it comes to education, we don't let the kindergartners hang out with the college students. You know, we need to be conscious as a church that when new believers come in, no matter what the affliction, uh, we need to have the church ready to, to start them out at the basics of what mm -hmm. salvation is and not assume that they're already caught up to the rest of the class. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very important that we have those foundational things that we start with and grow them from there. Uh, one of the first things we do is we have a sheet of how the Bible's laid out you know, the, 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 the Pentateuch, the history, um, and, and it goes right through the Bible so they can look at this sheet and say, okay, this is what the Bible is, this is how it's laid out to us, all the way up to the Gospels and into and, and Acts and then um, through all the letters. So it, it gives them a beginner's foundation to start with, but I, I think many times we have new people come in and we assume they're at the same level as everyone else mm -hmm. and we don't give them that attention of, let's get the basics down, let's, mm -hmm. let's build the foundation, mm -hmm. which is the salvation, yeah. which is the rock, which is Christ, and then we can start building on that. So as churches, we need to be responsible for those new people to know their, their, their infants, their daycare, mm -hmm. and let's treat them as such. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to take a break, but in a moment, I'd like to come back and I'd like to deal with this some more on this issue because uh, there is a, there is, you, you, you touched on it, the, the loud voice, the, the persuasive voice of homosexuality is different than many of the others. And uh, how do we deal with that as Christians effectively without appearing to be judgmental? Okay, we'll deal with that and more right after this. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. 
Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and we're continuing our discussion on homosexuality and, uh, and the church. You know, you, you mentioned earlier, Pastor John 3.16, drop down one more verse to verse 17, and it, it tells us that the Lord did not come into this world to condemn the world, but to save it, which tells me two things. One, um, he, he didn't come to push people down, but nonetheless, the world needs saving from something. Something's we were going already on. condemned. We were already <laughs> condemned. That's, the, that's the point yeah. right there. We were already condemned. Mm -hmm. How do we get that point across without appearing to condemn? How do we, the loud voice of the homosexuality community, homosexual community that you talked about, uh, how do we get to them? How do we do this in a loving way without pushing them away? Because they need the gospel. Like everybody needs the gospel. How do we do this? We can't cease to speak the truth. I'll say that, so I'm with yeah. my brother yeah. on that. Uh, you know, when, when I've uh, counseled uh, homosexuals before, uh, I, I just pray prayer. Mm -hmm. That's because there's a, definitely a spirit there, uh, an, an oppressing spirit. But, you know, I just ask God, please give me curious and graceful ways to address this. So that's, that's, that's not a firm strategy, you know, but, but as the Holy Spirit, you know, gives me words to speak, uh, you know, it, it seems to, to be the, the strategy that works for me. You know, if, if you tell somebody, I, regardless of what situation you're in, uh, if you're not married, you need to be celibate, okay? Well, that's a practical thing that you can do. Now, our society has really mucked that up, you know, because now, you know, any person can marry anyone. Uh, so, but I still think that, that, that those practical things, you know, help. Uh, if a person is a believing Christian, you know, they say, I'm gay, but I believe in Jesus Christ because I know many people like that, you know. So how do you go to that person and say, you, you can't, I'm not going to say they're not saved. Uh, I, I don't have, you know, the authority to do that. Uh, but, you know, just to at least give them some hope and a strategy in life to say, here's where you find yourself. Now, here's how you can move on in your Christian life. Well, let's, let's keep in mind that homosexuals even have their own churches. Gamblers, liars, adulterers, whatever. They don't have their own churches. But homosexuals have their own churches to back up and to support their position on this issue. It seems that it's going to take a lot of convincing to lovingly and without condemnation get them to see the truth of God's word. Am I right? Am I reading that right? Yeah, I see it as a, as a nurturing process. Um, you know, when, when, when my children were two, they, they stole from each other. I taught them that it was wrong immediately, and they continued to steal until we got to an understanding and they started respecting the authority of the father and then started submitting to his will to correct the action. So when you align it up with a secular world and the growth of a human being in respect to the child to the father, the same process is here. We can't, we can't condemn to the point that they leave the church. We have to nurture and love them through this process, continue the truth, guide them, but those one-on-one -on -one conversations, Brother here said, is very key, very key. Okay. We had a couple in a church. I was, a, yeah. I was pastoring a number of years ago, uh, a man and a woman. So this was a heterosexual um, sin issue that were living together. And I just felt like I needed to, to tell them the truth and to love them, not condemn them, not kick them out of the church, mm -hmm. uh, but to love them. Mm -hmm. They were only a part of our church for a number of months. They moved out of state. They, they, I had me to connect them to another church. Shortly thereafter, the Spirit of God convicted them of their sin of living together and fornicating. Uh, they went to their pastor, and he said, we need to make it right, and they got married on Christmas morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And those this people, they will tell, I've had so many tell me later, thank you, no one would mm -hmm. tell me the truth, you, yeah. you know? Yeah. And they appreciate Excellent. that so much. Excellent. Let's turn to another question that came in by, by a viewer. I have been hearing about pastors who believe 
abortion is okay. Isn't abortion killing a human life? How is this okay? Um, you know, abortion has been the law of the land since, uh, what, January 22nd of uh, 1973, the Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade. Um, it's still with us today. How do, we, how do we deal with this issue without appearing to be condemning, but to save lives? So we need to look at the history of the church in reference to the government. Uh, prior to the 1930s, um, the church took care of the poor. The church took care of the orphaned. Um, when, when the government established our current welfare system, um, currently when you run the numbers, our government pr provides a third of the assistance to the poor. The church still provides two thirds, uh, run the numbers. And, and so the, the, the one argument that I always get when this topic comes up in a conversation is, then who's gonna take care of those children that, that aren't aborted, that don't have someone? And this is where the church needs to shove the government out of that other third and take over the poor, which the Bible says to do. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the history of it and that's the long-term goal of it. Um, but that seems to always be the argument. So you're saying the church is running short of what God's commitment and mandate to us right. is. Right, if, if the church this. is gonna argue against abortion, then the church needs to be the solution to the children who are left over. Yes. The church yes. needs to be the solution. And prior to 1930s, that's how the system worked. An mm -hmm. orphan child was cared for by the church. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, need to, we need to take back the responsibility of the poor and inch the government out and take over the full three thirds and not two thirds of it. You want to chime in on that? Yes, I, I really do agree with that because I think we are so passionate as a church. Mm -hmm. We're so passionate about abortion, which we should be, yes. because abortion is murder. It really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I spoke to a mom about two weeks ago that had such regrets because of several abortions she had mm. um, engaged in over her youthful years. She said at nights, she said she's hearing babies crying. Mm -hmm. She says it's waking her up during the night. And she's always dreaming that she's pregnant. I mean, I really cried mm -hmm. when I heard that. Um, so it, it, abortion is, is, is a horrible act. Mm -hmm. But I have to agree with you, Pastor, that we preach it so adamantly, but we don't help to avoid it from happening. Amen. And so our young people that are engaging in, or whomever engage in, in this case, they're ashamed. We condemn them. We make them feel like, well, yes, I better hide it and I better do it quietly and deal with it than to let the church help me. And so I really do believe the church needs to step up. We, I think we weigh sin. The church does. We put sin on a scale mm -hmm. and there's some that are more weightier than others, some that are heavier than others. And yeah, I think yeah. abortion Pet happens to be, yeah, kind of yeah. Thing. Abortion seemed to be the, mm -hmm. the one that we, we will die over uh, sin is sin, mm -hmm. even though we know abortion is murder. Again, I'm going to say that. Yes. But I really do feel like the church, we as leaders, need to create an atmosphere, create an environment that can, it can stimulate that kind of help for those, like you said, yes. the third, is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's vital that we do that. Provide that environment of see how, what are we going to do with these mothers that have two and three kids, Give them the help with diapers, help with whatever we could so that they know we're not encouraging sin. Mm -hmm. But when it happens, mm -hmm. what happens? What are we going to do about it? And we've become such a reactive society on, mm -hmm. on this topic and many others. You know, we, we need to catch that next generation. You know, the Reagan administration, it was Nancy who started um, uh, say no to drugs mm -hmm. and, and, and look at where our culture is today with the opiate epidemic. So that didn't really play out the way that it should have, mm -hmm. but you, you approached it with secular means. It needs to be approached by spiritual means and abortion is no different. We need to catch that next generation and let them know that in Proverbs, the Bible does say that it's an abomination to, to take an innocent life. There's more scriptures than that. It's all through the Bible through the about Bible. an abomination to take yes. an innocent life. So we know that God says it's wrong, but we need to catch that next generation before the mother has three children and show her mm -hmm. the, the way to a celibate lifestyle, a, 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 
a non-fornicating lifestyle, to, to marry your partner and start to raise a family together with Christ at the center, and you'll have as many children as you need, and you'll have the resources to do that. So it's, it's a godly issue, and, and uh, can we reverse the clock on this? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. And abortion comes not only from that environment. What about rape and incest yes. and all of these things? Those that, are always arguments. Yeah, that come about with these, with these situations. Um, do we create a safe environment? that these folks can feel loved and not condemned because usually in that case they feel condemned so we're now we're you encompassing know? the legislative and judicial branches into this to change the laws to to make those punishments more severe for those people yeah. who are committing offenses against someone personally yeah. like that yeah there's a, it's, it's, it's a broad spectrum that has to be addressed yeah. in this I so appreciate this discussion. I think one aspect that we often miss, because we, we, we do want to con condemn the sin, but not the person, yeah. but in the process, we end up, unfortunately, sometimes condemning the person who's had okay. the abortion. So not only are they reeling from this, as, as you articulated earlier, but they continue to, and they feel the, the condemnation from the church. We should be the ones that are pointing people to the foot of the cross mm -hmm. where they can find forgiveness and they can find healing. And, and that, so that should be our, our job as well. Yes. There's one uh, creation of God that has the imprint of his image and that is humankind. Uh, not animals, not the flora, uh, it is, is we as humans. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is incumbent on the church, uh, and I know we all agree with this, that, that life uh, has, uh, human life has sanctity. And that's why, uh, you know, we feel so strongly about this. It, you know, if, if something other than a human dies, you know, we may say that's a sad thing and whatnot. But, you know, if, if it, that, this happens to a human, especially, as you say, a, an innocent human life, it's, it's horrible. Uh, and that's where, that's where the Bible uh, has said we should stand, and that's where I believe God stands. Yeah. And, and Pastor Williams, you, you said about um, the, the, the dreams that the female had, that the trauma that's associated with having an abortion. I, I think that a lot of, a lot of uh, women, if they, if they understood what that trauma was through testimonies, I think that that would give them a second forethought. There's a lady over here in Spencerville who does a retreat for women who've had abortions. It's a spiritual retreat. And part of that process, one of our, one of our congregation members went to that and, and part of that process, process was to name her child. And she found so much healing in that. So the other thing we have to do is treat the trauma that, that, the, that the female who had the abortion, uh, like you said, brother, send, send them to the foot of the cross and mm -hmm. show them the love of Jesus, that this isn't the unforgivable right. sin, okay? Right. You made mistakes right. based on your current condition, um, but there is so much trauma related afterwards that the female goes through that I don't think they're aware of. Excellent. Well, we're all out of time. Thank you very much. I think we're ending on a good note there. The fact that there are recovery programs that are there to help them yeah. in the physical, natural sense, and as well, uh, minister to the soul, because I think ultimately it is a satanic attack against God's image. You, you, you touched on that a moment ago, that the humans are the only ones who bear that image of God. It is a satanic attack against God's own image. All right, we'll be back with this same panel next week on this program. There's some other questions we need to get to that are just as interesting. So we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>